Welcome back to Carolina Journal Radio. I'm Mitch Kokai. The federal government has made trillions of dollars worth of promises to the American people in the form of Social Security and Medicare, but our next guest says he's confident those promises will be broken at some point. That was one of the key themes in the recent John W. Pope lecture from William Niskanen, chairman of the Cato Institute. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Good morning. So first of all, uh, that was a, a key theme that was brought out that, w that we've made all of these promises to people across the United States in the form of Social Security and Medicare, and there's just no way that those promises are going to be kept. Why? Well, because the taxes that are necessary to pay for these promises in the future, I think, will not be uh, supported by the American people. Uh, and these promises uh, have huge benefit, huge uh, debts. Social Security itself may be a, a debt of like 12 to 13 trillion. That's roughly equal to all of the output of the United States in a given year. And the debt for Medicare on the order of $65 trillion, that's on the order of five years of total output in the United States to meet that. It would take an increase in our tax rates of maybe 10 to 10 percentage points or more of uh, gross national product to, uh, to pay these debts. And I think that the American people and the American political system ultimately will not will not pay these debts. These two programs, in effect, are Ponzi schemes in the sense that it is easy to make the uh, promises to the current generation uh, that as long as the f future generations are going to be willing to pay for it. And I think that that's, uh, it is not a sustainable situation. Now, um, so I think that the, the, promises will be, the promises will be broken but I think that there are intelligent uh, ways to do it as is distinct from just saying, I'm sorry, you're on your own. Uh, I think that for Social Security, the primary way that we ought to change the promises is to increase the age for full retirement benefits, to reflect the fact that Americans are living a great deal longer than they were when this program was established. Americans, importantly, are younger longer. They're not, they're not older longer, they're younger longer. And they ought to be staying in the labor force until they're 75 or so. Uh, as you, a, as you say as a 75-year-old. <laughs> as, as yet tomorrow I will be 75 years old. And I have no plans whatsoever to retire. I told my staff several years ago that I will retire only under one of two conditions. One is if I'm bored, or second, in which case I'll tell them, or second is if I'm boring, in which case I expect them to tell me. But I have, otherwise, I have no plans to retire. I'm healthy and active, and uh, that is the case of a lot of people. I think one of the really tragic things that's happening in American life these days is quite healthy, vital people retire and then are bored themselves with retirement because their life in many ways has been defined by their job. And so they, they figure out a way to get back into the labor force. We, we still have uh, rules, both government rules and business rules, that I think are, discourage that. Uh, typically, a business will not keep anybody on their board, the corporate board, after age 70. There are an awful lot of skills out there in the United States uh, who, are, who uh, could serve well in corporate boards uh, after the age of 70. And the age 65 for Social Security was originally set by Chancellor Bismarck in Prussia at a time when few people lived that long. And of those who did, they only lived a few years longer. So I, would, I think the, the best way to change the promises on Social Security are two ways. One is to increase the age for full retirement benefits, maybe by, say, one year every 12 years, or one, year, uh, one month a year, indefinitely, because people are living longer and will continue to live longer. The second, I think, is that we can change the indexing formula for Social Security. It is now indexed to current wages, in, uh, but not, but, which are growing faster than prices. And if we change the indexing formula f from wages to prices, that will maintain the real benefits that people have been promised, uh, but not the relative benefits c compared to people who are continuing to work. And I think those are the ways that are most acceptable to changing the, uh, to breaking the promises, to changing the promises that are made to Social Security people. 
The other for Medicare is a more complex issue. Uh, the price of medical goods and services increase very rapidly, and we clearly can't sustain the kind of expenditures we have for Medicare. Um, and I think that the best way to do that is to is to have an income tested deductible for Medicare payments, in which um, you can only the the you pay an amount on your own up to a deductible, and then. Uh, the Medicare payments cut come in uh, only after the deductible is exhausted. We do have a, a, a suggestion for what that deductible might be in our, already in our tax code, in that we now can deduct from our taxes all medical expenses over 7.5% of our adjusted gross income. I don't know whether that's the right number or not, but it's that sort of thing in which uh, wealthy people then would have a higher deductible than uh, poorer people. And uh, it would be, uh, I think, not much of an, uh, if any, an increase in the burden for poor people, and rich people can, can afford it. Otherwise the, otherwise, the expense of this all gets transferred to our young people, our children and our grandchildren. That is the voice of William Niskanen, chairman of the Cato Institute. If you'd like to hear what he has to say again, you can listen to the Carolina Journal Radio podcast. Just log on to carolinajournalradio.com for more information about the podcast. It is available each week. I wanted to get back to the tax issue with you because you mentioned at the outset that the American people are just not going to accept the level of taxation. We're not talking about an extra 1%, an extra 2%, major changes would be needed to pay yes. for these things. It would take, uh, I think, an increase in our average tax burden, which is now about 30% of adjusted gross income, to uh, 40 to 45% to meet these two promises. And that, uh, I think, would be both unacceptable to the, uh, from the point of view of the taxpayer and would have very severe consequences on the U.S. economy. One of the things you pointed out in this John W. Pope lecture in Raleigh was the idea that the last tax dollar assessed uh, takes out about $2.75 from the economy. If you can briefly explain that to us. Well, it takes out a dollar for the amount of taxes that are raised. And the difference between a dollar and two seventy-five dollars is the reduction in pre-tax output and income that is a consequence of higher tax rates. Tax rates have a, a large, severe, adverse effect on, on the output of the economy that operates through a reduction of work effort, work, uh, hours work per person uh, drop. Some people drop out of the labor force. And it has, has an even larger effect on productivity. Uh, taxes severely distort the allocation of labor and capital and the uh, division of efforts among different types of products and goods and services and so forth. And so the, the total cost to the economy of government spending that is financed by taxes is more than the, the taxes itself. It is the taxes plus the effect on the economy, which is quite the large and significant and, and negative. And if we tried to raise the rates beyond where they are now, this effect gets even higher or greater, doesn't it? Yes, that's right, in the sense that the, uh, the adverse effect on the economy are a function of the uh, level of the rates and uh, conditions in the economy which, which relate the, uh, the amount of uh, economic output to the level of the rates. That is the voice, once again, of William Niskanen, chairman of the Cato Institute. Thanks for joining us. You're most welcome. And we'll have more on Carolina Journal Radio in just a moment.